Hi, I'm Angus Cress Gillespie, professor of American studies at Rutgers University and your host for Old Ways in New Jersey. Now, a lot of people think that New Jersey is a place of industrialization and congestion and high taxes and super highways. And all that's true in a sense, but in order to really understand the old time way of life, you have to get off the super highways. So today we're going to take a stroll down College Avenue of Rutgers University here in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Now the interesting thing about College Avenue is it's really the heart of old Rutgers College and it's a very busy place. You find students and professors walking up and down. You have many departments, everything ranging from anthropology to urban studies. And particularly interesting for us today is the fact that as the college expanded from east to west, as the city expanded from east to west, new buildings were built along College Avenue. And so what you have, starting in 1830s, going all the way to the 1930s, is a, a laboratory, really, of historical architecture. So we're going to start at the eastern end, take a stroll down College Avenue, and really have a survey of about 100 years of historic American architecture. Okay, we're going to start our tour of uh, College Avenue uh, here at the corner of Somerset Street, and we're looking at Alexander Johnson Hall. It's kind of an interesting story behind all this. Uh, as early as, as 1768, a group of concerned citizens started what they called uh, the Rutgers Preparatory School or the Grammar School. The idea was to get young people ready uh, to attend uh, Rutgers College. Well, by 1830, uh, Nicholas Wyckoff uh, built the present structure, which now houses uh, not the Rutgers Prep, which has moved out, out of town, but instead it, it houses university relations. And uh, here to explain more about the historical architecture with me is Elizabeth Reeves, licensed architect at Rutgers University. Thank you, Angus. Yeah. Um, this building is really interesting building. The original grammar school was housed in the old Queens building, as was the seminary and the college. As the college grew, it outgrew the grammar school first. So in 1837, uh, Nicholas Wyckoff came and built the grammar school across the street from the Queens building. It is technically the second academic building built here at Rutgers. The original building was two stories high, uh, and it has all of the characteristics of the typical school buildings of the period. It's one of the last remaining uh, prototypes for that particular uh, type of design. It has a rectangular tower, I see. Yes, in 1869. Henry Hardenberg, who was the great-great-grandson of the first president of Rutgers, was hired to do an addition to the building. At that point, he built the wing to the right and added the third floor to the building. What was added was a gymnasium and a swimming pool to the building. Was the tower part of the original building? The tower was shorter and was part, the, the full height was added on in um, the uh, 1800s, the Hardenberg edition. And if I'm not mistaken, that's a slate roof. Yes, it is. So and it was built to last. It was built to last. We just, within the last uh, 10 years, replaced the roof slates. Now this building is on the National Register of Historic Places. So when the roof slates were taken off, they were replicated exactly before they were uh, replaced. 
Uh, all of the trim has been painted. What we have yet to do is to take the paint off of the walls and re-expose the brick and the stone foundation. It should make it a very lovely addition to the rest of the college um, and help hold the streetscape that is now uh, Rutgers University. Okay, here we are at the Bildner Center for Jewish Life, and uh, a lot goes on here. They sponsor visiting scholars, uh, their teacher training programs, but of course what we're focused on is the architecture, and as I look at it today, I see bracketed eaves, I see uh, a tower, I see uh, these round-headed windows that are more vertical uh, than wide, and all that speaks to me as Italianate, and yet I'm told that it was originally had a kind of Moorish style. So Elizabeth, can you fill us in a little bit on that? Yes, well this is what I meant by American vernacular. It's a building that started out as a non-Western building with lots of Moorish detail and uh, dome-like roofs over top of bay windows. Uh, the tower had a tall peak on it. Uh, we had round bracketry on the front porch. Now, as the use changed, uh, they enclosed the front porch, they shortened or eliminated the second floor bay window, and they changed the style of the building from this Moorish, Moorish character uh, into the Italianate character, which would have been more popular in the latter part of the 19th century. The building was originally built to house the students from Rutgers Prep, so it was a dormitory. Uh, okay, here we are at number 24 College Avenue, which is now used as the, for the Confucius Institute, and I would say it's probably a Greek revival. We have uh, three windows over the top of one door and two windows, sort of bilaterally symmetrical, but not entirely. Elizabeth, can you tell us more about this building? Yes, this is actually the only Greek Revival building left on College Avenue. It was rehabilitated last summer. Uh, the siding painted, the shutters replaced. The, the end result, however, is that most of the Greek Revival houses in New Brunswick were uh, added to as the styles changed. So when the avenue began to, began to really develop, they added brackets to the building and tried to make it look more like a Victorian building. What gives it away is that we have a low pitched roof, we have the overhanging uh, eaves, we also have a typical Greek doorway the beginning of last summer, that was all wrapped in aluminum, and we very carefully took all of the aluminum off and restored the woodwork to the original door, and that screams Greek revival. The other thing is, and we're going to see a lot of these, this is a side hall Victorian or, uh, house. This would have been a townhouse, as are most of the houses along the avenue. Now, all of this property was owned by the same person who donated the Queen's campus to Rutgers College, a man by the name of James Parker. This was all part of the French's mine tract. Now, as the mine failed and the businesses began to pop up over on George Street, in order to make a profit on the property, it was subdivided into lots, and College Avenue was put in uh, down partway, uh, about halfway down the street, and the lots were subdivided into relatively small uh, pieces, and houses gradually grew on those pieces. Here we are at number 30 College Avenue, which is now the Center for International Affairs. Uh, I'm having a little trouble putting a classification on this. It's, it's clearly vernacular. Can you help us out? 
Uh, yes, it has all kinds of different elements to it. It has the classical hoods over top of the windows. It also has the period floor to ceiling glass in the front room. The uh, building L to the left is obviously an addition. And most of the houses of this style in the city also have that addition on them. Are the bracketed eaves original to the building? The bracketed eaves are original to the building and they again signify a later period of time. Probably the mid 19th century, maybe 1850 or so, when the Victorians were starting to become popular amongst the upper middle class. Uh, College Avenue was almost a miracle mile avenue uh, with, filled with professors and relatively wealthy merchants and so on. Um, so the bracketry begins to recall a very simplified Italianate. The early Victorians, of course, were much simpler than the high Victorians. So I would classify this as an early Victorian house, townhouse. Okay, we're here at the uh, grease truck parking lot, and we're with these terracotta gates. So I assume it wasn't always a grease truck parking lot. No, this actually was one of the most spectacular mansions here in New Brunswick. It was the home of Robert Wood Johnson Sr. Uh, for a very, very long time. The university uh, got it, I, I can't remember whether it was through donation or we bought it from uh, uh, the Johnson family. And for a long time it housed the student union, uh, various other alumni center, so on and so forth. Eventually it was torn down and of course, per Joni Mitchell, they put up a parking lot. Uh, but remnants of the estate still remain. For example, in the stone wall, the iron fence, uh, the terracotta castings, which of course are indicative of the New Jersey terracotta industry. In addition, where the grease trucks are used to be uh, another house that was willed to Bodwin College, and Bodwin sold it to Rutgers and of course, Rutgers eventually tore it down. It was not in good shape and made way for the grease trucks. You know, you mentioning uh, tearing it down uh, puts me in mind that uh, not everything at Rutgers is perfect, but one thing that's pretty commendable is uh, we do have a tendency to save the old buildings wherever possible. This is a relatively new idea here at Rutgers. Um, all of a sudden there is a huge push to preserve Rutgers traditions and characters on this campus. As we continue to build on the other campuses, we're building modern buildings. Of course, laboratories have to have up-to-date equipment which doesn't fit in these eclectic buildings. But because College Avenue is always perceived as the historic heart of the campus, yeah. it has a very long history. Uh, people have become very, very interested yeah. in preserving what we have. It would even probably be fair to say that uh, looking at the College Avenue campus as a whole, it, it's bounded on the north by the Raritan River and on the south by College Avenue. That's correct. It is a, a very long, straight, almost flat uh, axis that defines the campus. And, and as, we, as we move uh, from east to west, we're really moving through time. We really are, because as the campus expanded, the years changed, new styles came into being, and they really do follow the track of the buildings that were built along College Avenue. Uh, over the period of a hundred years. Okay, uh, let's continue our stroll down the avenue. Thank you. Okay, we're here at number 46 College Avenue, which is currently housing career services. And uh, to my untrained eye, this sure looks like Queen Anne. We have the rounded turret and asymmetrical facade. But uh, perhaps, Elizabeth, you can fill us in on the architecture here. 
Uh, yes, you're absolutely right, Angus. It is a Queen Anne. One of the markers of the Queen Anne style is, of course, the turret and the steeply pitched roof on the turret. The other indication that lets us know that it is Queen Anne is, of course, the detail. We have the brackets and we have the diamond-shaped details going up the rake board. Uh, the front porch was originally just uh, an open uh, front porch, which is the little glassed-in porch there. The side porch would have been uh, more of a, a sitting area, if you will. The building has been added onto in the rear, but it is the only example of a Queen Anne with a turret available on the College Avenue uh, house uh, walk. Okay, we're here at number 56 College Avenue. It's now being used by Career Services. And as I'm uh, eyeballing this building, I'm really kind of stuck as to how to describe it. it it's clearly vernacular. Uh, if it's got a little of this and a little of that, uh, those windows on the first floor are kind of Italianate, and uh, the roof line is kind of temple form. And um, I'm baffled. We'll turn it over to Elizabeth, see what she has to say. Okay, well, this building and the next couple of buildings are actually very interesting. First of all, they have not been rehabilitated. So it is di very difficult to figure out what is going on itself with the building. This is a typical side hall vernacular home with a side, what used to be a porch, and an addition with an enclosure on the second floor. But the main body of the building is three bays wide. It has very delicate detail, both in the pediment and then in the, um, the window uh, pediments. So it's an early Victorian. I would say this is about 1860, based on the size and shape of the brick of the foundation. Uh. So it would be that very early um, Victorian-ish, certainly not high Victorian. Uh, as we progress down the street, we're going to see more and more high Victorians. Uh, but it's a really good example. Uh, when we rehabilitate these buildings, one of the things that we try to do is uh, accentuate the trim by using color. Uh. So you don't have to look so hard, you don't have to think about it, you just see the beauty of, of the building. You gave us an interesting clue a moment ago. You said that in dating these things, look at the brickwork of the foundation. That's kind of interesting. Uh, yes, the brick from uh, the middle of the 19th century was what they call a soft burn brick. So the brick itself uh, was relatively rough. They also were smaller than today's brick. So if you take a look at them very, even though these have been painted, you can see the form of the brick, how irregular they are. That's very typical of a soft burn brick. Um, this is the type of brick when we do do restoration or rehabilitation, never sandblast this type of brick because once the burn coat comes off, the brick is so soft, it will weather very, very quickly and then disintegrate. Ah, very interesting. This is one of the things that we have to, to look for when we do these old houses. Well, here, starting with number 56, in effect, we have three buildings in a row. Let's move on and take a look at the other two. Okay. Okay, we're here at number 60 College Avenue, uh, which is currently being used by the Art History Department as an annex building. Uh, looking at it, I'd say it's kind of stick style, uh, typical of the uh, late 19th century. Underneath that uh, siding, you've got a balloon frame building with a lot of decorative features. Uh, the intersecting roof planes would suggest that it's kind of East Lakeian. Um, it's probably carpenter built. Elizabeth, can you tell us a little more about this uh, architecture? Yes, this architecture was actually very popular about the same time all of these buildings were built. Um, but it is what they call carpenter gothic, and it would be the gothic part comes with the steepness of the roof. 
Um, the original windows had a segmental arch in them, uh, which is difficult to see because of the storm windows. Uh, however, that makes it a little bit different, just a little bit from the other windows. Uh, from the old photographs that we have found, there was a lot of detail uh, where the white uh, band is at the second floor. That had all kinds of carved decorative applied detail in it. Uh, the uh, Eve um, gable end siding was all vertical, board and batten. Uh, it was different colors. The front porch, of course, is now enclosed. And uh, the wrong style windows, which make all the difference in the world, it's very awkward to see the second floor windows be larger than the first floor windows. Um, it is, again, a side hall, uh, mm. Victorian structure, townhouse. Uh, as we have seen all along. Uh, but the front porch uh, itself has been greatly altered, as has the entryway. It was originally a double-doored entryway. Uh, Here is some of that soft burn brick uh, in, that has been left exposed. Those are the original piers supporting the porch. Uh, uh, so yeah. we know exactly where the porch posts were, and we have a remnant of that's in fact, uh, conjecture is now fact. Okay, let's move on and take a look at the third of these three. We're here at number 64 College Avenue. It's the third of these three buildings in a row. Uh, I would say that this is more on the lines of high Victorian because we all already have a, a mansard roof. That's correct. The later styles of the Victorian starting to emerge into now the high Victorian, which was essentially a wealthier uh, type of Victorian, much more of a mansion, a grander display of knowledge, which is also expressive of wealth at the time. The building probably dates to about 1870, 1880, uh, not likely as far as 1890 is concerned. But certainly the decorative hoods over top of the windows, those are cast iron. And uh, they were painted individually. Fortunately for us, they have been left exposed. Um, the windows themselves on the first floor are enormous. They're almost eight foot tall. Uh, the ceilings are around 10 foot high on the first floor. And worth mentioning in these buildings, and this goes for all of them actually that we have seen so far, there was no such thing as air conditioning. And heat at this point was provided usually by uh, coal fireplaces, coal burning fireplaces. These houses were all designed to be the most energy efficient structures because they took advantage of the natural daylight they took advantage of the prevailing winds, uh, the um, cool in the summer because of the openings of the windows, and then warm in the winter uh, by shuttering up the windows. Uh, the uh, hot air in the summer would rise to the top of the ceiling with the cooler air down below. So they were very energy efficient. Um, without uh, using any kind of uh, fuel. Now, on this particular building, the front, front porch is somewhat altered, and as you can see, the building has not been yet rehabilitated. Um, the eaves originally had brackets, which probably still exist beneath the aluminum soffits. Uh, we are going to have to unwrap different portions of that to find out what's there. Uh, the roof now is a specific kind of mansard roof where the roof actually is a concave curve. Usually when we think of the high Victorian um, Second Empire buildings, they are a convex curve. But that's what dates this a little bit earlier than uh, the latter part of the 19th century. In architectural history, they often say that the origin of the mansard roof 
in France was due to tax policy. That that uh, if it looked like it was part of the roof, then it wasn't part of the building and your taxes would be lower. Um, it actually had less to do with taxes than it had to do with zoning ordinances. Uh -huh. After the disastrous fire in London of 1666, uh, the, a lot of the cities began to develop zoning ordinances. In, uh, in Paris, you could only build a two-story high building. Typically, the buildings on the ground floor were shops and then the owner of the shop lived on the second floor. But all of his house help, the manservants and the maids, lived in the garret. So the mansard roof was considered the attic, and that's where the household help lived, or if need be, they would rent that space out. So it originally started as sort of a fudge factor. Yes. Uh, but then people liked the way it looked and it became stylish. It became stylish and of course it was named after uh, its developer, a man by the name of Mansard. Very interesting. Okay, let's move on. We're at 84 College Avenue, which is currently used by the Department of Italian. What we have here is a 19th century vernacular side hall building. There's some interesting details. We've got a mansard roof on the third floor, and it's an interesting ventilation there, which uh, Elizabeth, I understand, could be brought out and accented with paint. That's correct. One of the objects that we plan on doing with these buildings is accentuating all of that detail. This happens actually to be one of my uh, favorite buildings, only because it's so overlooked and it is such a gorgeous building with its original detail intact. Certainly some of the eaves and fascias have been wrapped, but the bulk of the detail still comes out. Um, it's just a sweet, sweet little building. Now, I'm going to refer to a little bit about the Italian department. When these houses were first acquired by the university, the departments or the people who uh, used these buildings called them houses. So it's technically the Italian house, the German house, there was an English house, the Ivy Club, the Music House, but they were all referred to as houses. And in some regards, I almost wish that we could go back to that nomenclature again, because they are, after all, houses. Yeah, it, it suggests a sort of a, a warmth or intimacy or domesticity. That's correct. Now this, and in relation to um, uh, the last building that we looked at, this has that convex mansard roof yes. to it. So instead of the concave. Um, also, a lot of the glass in this building and the windows are original to the building, but particularly in the front door, it is the original beveled glass. I'd like to thank Elizabeth Rees for joining me this afternoon on our tour of the architecture of College Avenue. And I think we'll close right here for now, but please join us for part two when we will continue our tour of the architecture of College Avenue. <laughs>